Hey guys and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series where today I have some Jane Doe cases to share with you. We have one case from Missouri and two more from Tennessee, all in the USA. And none of these cases have enough information for a full length video, but I figured I would take some cases from neighbouring states sticking in the same vague kind of area and just share as many details as I can about all of them. It does always make me sad that my Jane Doe cases never tend to entice as many clicks, but they are actually the episodes that I feel most passionately about, so please do feel free to share this with others if you think they'd be interested, especially if you live in either of the states that we're focusing on today or in either of the areas. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the stories of two Jane Does, both from Tennessee, both named the Davidson County Jane Does, one from 1976 and another from 1998 and the West Alton Jane Doe, or the St Charles County Jane Doe, she is known by both names. We're going to be starting with the latter, being the body of a child discovered over 54 years ago in Alton Lake in West Alton, Missouri. Her identity and her killer never found, and it remains a cold case today. This mystery began on the 1st of February 1968, when two fishermen on Alton Lake near Highway 67 and the Clark Bridge over the Mississippi River spotted something strange under the water about 12 feet from the shore and 3 feet deep. It seemed to them to be a suitcase, which they managed to get up onto the shore to open, which wasn't an easy feat as the suitcase had been weighted down with barbells, four 10 pound weights, two of which were inside and two of which were strapped to the outside. Whoever had placed this suitcase in the water clearly didn't intend for it to be dragged up. The entire suitcase was tied up with blue clothesline as well. When they opened the suitcase, they found inside the body of a child. It wasn't quite the hidden treasure they were hoping to find. I don't think they opened it expecting to find a body. Obviously, the authorities were called to the scene and the child's body, the body of a little girl, was taken for autopsy. But as far as I've been able to find online, no cause of death was ever found. She was thought to have died a relatively short while before her body was found, possibly just a few weeks earlier. Even though no outward signs of murder or foul play were found on her body, this case is classed as a homicide, likely due to the length somebody went to to hide her body. She definitely didn't put herself in that suitcase. It's not thought that she drowned, but there was a bit of water in her lungs, so death by drowning wasn't entirely ruled out. Some sources state that authorities think she may have been strangled, but I don't think that's anything official. Despite not being able to discern a cause of death though, they were able to get together a decent description of the child. It was a female body, she was white with long blonde or strawberry blonde hair, she was two to three years old, meaning she would have been born around 1965 to 1966, she was two for eight and around 35 to 40 pounds. She was just a little girl, she was a toddler. When you're talking about it or when you're looking back in history, the 1960s does seem so long ago, it sounds like a long time ago, but my parents were actually born around the same time that this Jane Doe was, and I consider my parents to still be fairly young, living their best lives. It pains me to think of all the life this little girl missed out on, she wouldn't be that old. Jane Doe was too decomposed to determine her eye colour, and the only clothing she was found in was some white underwear. She also had a scar above one eye, although we don't know which eye it was. Namer states that she did have a recognisable face, which does suggest that the subsequent artist renderings of her face must be fairly accurate. For my podcast listeners, you're not going to be able to see what I'm about to share on screen, but I would highly recommend you Google St Charles Jane Doe composite sketches so you can have a visual aid of her face. A young girl with a light smile looking directly at the viewer. To me, in this drawing, she does look slightly older than two to three years old, but we also have another drawing in which she does look significantly younger, provided by the National Centre of Missing and Exploited Children. There's also this 2014 computer rendering by Carl Koppelman, in which she looks a lot more lifelike. Her dental charts are available, and notably she had one abnormally large tooth. Sadly though, her fingerprints are not available and there's also no DNA to work with according to Doe Network, who have stated there is insufficient DNA for profiling. Jane Doe was originally buried just one week after her discovery in an unmarked grave in the children's section of the Oak Grove Cemetery, and it seems like after that point her case went cold very, very quickly. 
That same month, a man did come forward saying he thought Jane Doe might be his missing three-year-old daughter. She'd been missing for about eight weeks alongside her mother and a sibling, but it was eventually determined that it wasn't his missing daughter using footprints from his daughter's birth certificate. I hope he did find his family eventually, but I couldn't find out if he did. Extensive investigation at the time in the communities surrounding the lake found that there were no missing children in the area, so it is thought that somebody travelled a fair bit to dump her body in this lake, or it might have just been somebody passing through who saw the lake and took advantage. For a long time, nothing happened in this case. It disappeared to the bottom of the cold case files, until around 2002 when a St. Charles police detective called Stephanie Fisk stumbled across the report when she was on light duty in the records department. When Stephanie was eventually assigned to detective 13 years later, one of her first missions was to solve the case of this Jane Doe, which is said to be the coldest and oldest of the nine cold cases in the St. Charles police department. When she got promoted, Stephanie asked her sergeant if she could take a look into the case and he agreed, with her saying the story just really bothered her. And she did manage to get movement. In 2015, Jane Doe's body was exhumed in the hope that they might be able to recover some DNA, with Stephanie saying to Brett Autumn for the St. Charles County Community News, we're looking to extract DNA from her. That way, if we do get a tip or if there is any data already on file, we can compare and maybe use for identification. She also said she hoped that the University of Tennessee would be able to do a better recreation from her skull. However, as I've sadly already covered, the DNA that they were able to recover from the remains is insufficient for DNA profiling. At least as far as I was able to find, I couldn't find any newspaper articles specifically stating this, but it does seem to be the general consensus across the internet, and that is what Doe Network has stated. But I wouldn't write it off completely, as years go by the technology used for this is only going to improve, and there's every chance that one day they will be able to find something. But it does mean that for the meantime, they're still relying on good, old-fashioned detective work in this case for the moment, hoping that news of this story will reach the right person who will come forward with the tip that will finally provide answers. Detectives are asking for anyone with any information to come forward, even if they're unsure if it will be helpful or not. If you know of a young girl around this time who disappeared who might have looked even a tiny bit like the forensic sketches, just come forward with the information. Stephanie has said, we encourage the public to continue sharing her image and forwarding new leads to us. She deserves her name back and to rest in peace. They're willing to follow up on any leads to get answers here, and not just tips about the girl's identity either. Even if you've got suspicion about her potential killer, that's also just as helpful. A lot of the time in cases like this one, answers to one of those questions, identity or killer, will generally lead to the answer of the other. I'm going to leave details down below of who to contact if you do happen to have any information in this case. Next up, I want to talk about the first of two Davidson County Jane Doe's, this one from 1976. It was the 24th of March in Nashville, Davidson County, Tennessee, when yet another fisherman came across our Doe's body in the Harpeth River, about 200 yards from a bridge on McCrory Lane. This is southwest of Nashville on the outskirts of the city, but it's definitely not a particularly rural or quiet area. The body had washed up against a branch in the river in an area of water that usually only stood about two feet high, and it was very clear that she hadn't died too long before she was found. The later autopsy would estimate that she'd only died a few hours beforehand, and authorities think she drowned in the same river in which she was found. However, the circumstances around this Jane Doe's death are unknown. They don't know whether it was an accident or a homicide, but there were several abrasions on her body which could have suggested that she was held underwater by someone else. It's estimated that Jane Doe was a teenager from 14 to 17 years old. She was female, 5'2", 120 to 140 pounds, with brown or black long hair and brown eyes. She's thought to be white, Native American and or Hispanic, but from the forensic recreations of her face, I wouldn't personally say she seems to be white. Jane Doe also had several distinguishing marks or features that could potentially help with identification, including two surgical scars on her abdomen and some older scars, possibly cigarette burns on both of her arms. 
She had a mole near her left eye and is described as having a large build with very large breasts for her estimated age. Her dental records are available and her teeth could also be a very distinguishing feature that could help with her identification. She had a fang tooth that was oddly positioned as well as a number of fillings and decay in other teeth. Her fingerprints are also available for comparison but they currently don't have any DNA available and likely won't do anytime soon as exhumation just isn't possible at this point. In the decades since her burial, grave markers have been moved and nobody knows exactly where her body is located anymore. Fingers crossed they will find it eventually though. There actually are post-mortem police photographs available of this victim. I won't include them in this video because I know a lot of people completely understandably don't like to see photos of the deceased, but I will be including a link in the description box just in case anybody does want to see. Obviously, these are the best chance anyone has of actually being able to recognise this Jane Doe, so if you do want to have a look, please, please do. Jane Doe also had a blood alcohol level of 0.28 when she died, which is quite high, she was definitely drunk. According to the internet, at blood alcohol levels of 0.2 to 0.29, you'll feel confused and disorientated with a lack of balance and muscle control. You might need help walking, you'll likely have nausea and vomiting and a lack of gag reflex. She was actually erring close to 0.3%, at which point your blood alcohol level is considered dangerously high and you'll probably end up blacking out. Jane Doe was wearing a white bra and a pair of jeans when she was found. She wasn't wearing a top, although a blue blouse was discovered in the river the day after she was. It's unclear if it did belong to her or not, but it is a bit of a coincidence if it didn't. So it probably did, but they can't say that for sure. In terms of jewellery, she was wearing a rawhide bracelet and a choker style necklace with beads and a white dove. On her person, she had a black comb and a single nickel, as well as a photograph of a young blonde boy in her back pocket, on which little Charlie and a phone number was written on the back. Of course, investigators called the phone number, but it turned out that little Charlie was not the name of the boy in the photo. The name instead referred to a 20-year-old man called Charles Moore from East Nashville. He was called Little Charlie because his father was Big Charlie. Now this Charlie told detectives that him and his brother-in-law Milton Collins had been driving southeast along Interstate 24 near Nashville on the 15th of March when they spotted two female hitchhikers. Now this was nine days before Jane Doe's body would be found. Charlie and Milton picked up the hitchhiking girls who told them that they were travelling to Haines City in Florida and they did positively identify Jane Doe's body as one of these girls who they said called herself either Sherry or Cheryl. The girls told the men that they'd run away from a treatment facility, probably in the Minneapolis St Paul area where Jane Doe said that she'd been being treated for alcoholism and the friend said she'd been treated for suicidal tendencies, even showing the men the scars on her wrist. They described the friend as thin with sandy blonde hair and wire rimmed glasses and they had said they were on their way to Haines City to see the friend's husband. Now if the girls were indeed from the Minneapolis St Paul area, they were essentially travelling their way from the top to the bottom of the USA, likely hitchhiking their entire journey there. Tennessee probably would have been about their halfway point, maybe just over which does suggest there might have been multiple other people on their journey who might have given them lifts and learned more about them. There are potentially other people out there who know their names, more information about their backgrounds. The blonde friend has never been able to be tracked down, it's not known if she met the same fate as her friend or was involved in the death in any way. After hearing the girls' sad, sad stories, Charlie said he wrote his phone number on the only piece of paper they had available in the car, which was the back of a photograph of Milton's young son, and told the girls to get in contact if they were ever in the area again. They then dropped the girls off at the Winchester exit of Interstate 24, and the girls apparently immediately started flagging down another car for the next portion of their journey. And then just nine days later, Jane Doe was found 90 to 100 miles from that point where she was last seen, which was actually in the wrong direction from where she was supposed to be heading. She should have continued to travel southeast, 750 more miles to Haines City, Florida, but instead her body was found 90 miles northwest of where she'd been dropped off by Charlie and Milton. Now, of course, the two men were questioned in regards to the case, I think probably questioned multiple times over the next couple of years, but they were ruled out as suspects. 
I mean, you would have to be a very stupid killer to leave your name and phone number in a victim's back pocket, I suppose. But we have seen many stupid killers on this channel. Of course, investigators looked at treatment facilities and rehabs around the St Paul, Minneapolis area, but no facilities admitted to the disappearance of two young women with similar descriptions. You would probably assume that if the girls were in a facility in this area, that they might have originally come from Minnesota, that that's where their families would also have been found. But quite often, families would send wayward teenagers to places like this out of state, especially in the 70s and before, just to try and avoid the stigma of some of their teenagers' bad behaviour. So maybe investigators should have been looking in neighbouring states as well as just Minnesota. Of course, that is just pure speculation on my behalf though. And this, of course, all depends on whether or not you actually believe the girls were telling the truth in the first place. Perhaps they just enjoyed telling tall tales to the people who picked them up on the way. Maybe they made it a game to relieve boredom. However, the fact that the blonde girl did have self-harm scars on her wrist does suggest that perhaps there is some truth to the story. But you are just taking them at their words. Even the name Sherry or Cheryl might have been fake. I mean, what reason would they have to tell strangers their real name? And there's every chance that if Jane Doe's family packed her away to a facility out of state, that they never reported her as missing when she never came home or disappeared from the facility. Maybe they just wiped their hands of her. I've also seen speculation that maybe Jane Doe was in the care of the state or was in just a general situation of abuse, which could explain the cigarette looking burns on her arms. Some other people suspect that it was more of a residential facility than a treatment facility that they were at. Maybe they were in the care of the state, considered a lost cause, and the state never really bothered to file a report when the girls went missing. Regardless, Jane Doe would have been classed as a runaway, and in this time, people didn't really care to look for teenage runaways. I mean, still a lot of the time now, they don't either. The blonde companion has never been found. She's never come forward, either out of fear that she'll be implicated in Jane Doe's death, or chances are that she came to a similar fate and her body was just never found, or if it was, the connection has never been made. If her body was found in a different jurisdiction or county or state, the lack of computerised data in this time could have just meant they were never connected. Or perhaps the girls weren't even that close, maybe they got split up on their journey and the blonde had just never realised what happened. If we were to find the blonde, we'd likely be able to get a lot more answers. Once again, I'll leave contact details for the relevant authorities down below. And finally, we have another Davidson County Jane Doe, but this case is much more recent, from 1998. This case is also often referred to as the Nashville Jane Doe, where she was found murdered in Nashville, Tennessee. There seems to be a bit of an accidental theme throughout this video, as this Jane Doe was also recovered from a body of water. On the morning of Wednesday 18th of March 1998, a tugboat captain reported seeing a body floating in the Cumberland River, the river that runs directly through the centre of Nashville. This was on part of the river running through the west side of the city, running parallel to Interstate 40 near Cleese's Ferry. A rescue squad was called who pulled the body out of the river and it was very quickly determined that she'd been shot in the head twice. Now I do want to note here that the Doe Network page seems to have a bit of a discrepancy with the date of discovery, stating 17th of March at the top under date of discovery, but 18th of March in the circumstances of discovery part. NamUs also shares 17th of March as the date the body was found. Through my research, I'm actually inclined to believe it was the 18th, but I'm very open to corrections on that. But regardless, it was the 17th or 18th of March, 1998. Thanks to the cause of death, two gunshot wounds in the head, it was very quickly determined that Jane Doe's death was a homicide, and it's thought that she died only about an hour prior to being discovered. Her estimated age is 30 to 55 years old, she was white and or Hispanic, 5 foot 2 and 167 pounds, so she was overweight. She had dyed light brown to blonde hair, wavy in texture and about 5 inches in length, reaching just below her chin. She had green or hazel eyes and no distinguishing marks or features. Interestingly, it's not thought this victim was a transient. She clearly took great care of herself in life and she had had extensive, expensive work done on her teeth at some point with very expensive bridge work. Investigators at the time estimated that she'd had about $10,000 worth of dental care and that's in the 90s, so $10,000 would have gone a lot further back then as well. 
If you have that much money spare for dental work, the likelihood is that you generally live quite comfortably. And of course, this is a vast generalisation, but if you do have access to that much money, you're likely not isolated in the community, so people probably would have known her. Jane Doe wasn't living on the streets, at least not for her entire life. At the time of her discovery, Jane Doe was wearing torn black nylon trousers with a Looney Tunes patch reading Sport, Tweety and Twaining, and white pants. It doesn't seem like she was wearing any clothes on her top half, but was still wearing one white Reebok tennis shoe with red trim. In terms of jewellery, she had on a gold necklace with a gold Zodiac Leo emblem and two rings, one dark grey and one lighter gold. This potentially suggests that the motive behind the murder might not have been robbery, otherwise the jewellery probably would have been taken. It also suggests that this woman was a Leo, born between the 24th of July and August 23rd, although of course we don't know what year. Don't let that narrow you down though when searching for identities, it is more than possible that perhaps she was wearing the zodiac symbol of a close loved one, or maybe she just liked the look of it. After the news of this murder was spread, a local remembered speaking to the woman the evening before her body was discovered. This was a clerk at a Valley Market store on Music Valley Drive in Donaldson, which is the complete opposite side of the city to where Jane Doe was found, but still interestingly right next to the river. I couldn't find any analysis online about how fast the tide was that day, how fast it is generally, so I don't really know if it's possible if Jane Doe was dumped in the river at a different point, perhaps this side of the city, and she floated to the other side, but she was found just an hour after her death, so probably not. Apparently Music Valley Drive is upstream from where she was found though, so it is technically possible. I do find it improbable though that she would have been able to float through the entire centre of the city of Nashville though with no one raising the alarm, so I am inclined to think that she was dumped closer to where she was found. But I digress. The clerk at the store remembered Jane Doe clearly, as she complimented the Leo necklace that she was wearing, and she also remembers that Jane Doe was in the company of a black man who was also wearing a very similar necklace, a gold chain with a gold zodiac pendant. She also recalled the man wearing a white Tweety Bird t-shirt with black pants, as opposed to the woman's Tweety Bird trousers. Despite having that memory, the sighting with the clerk clearly didn't lead to any further information about the woman though. Whilst Doe Network states the status of both fingerprints and DNA are unknown for Jane Doe, an article I found in the Wayback Machine states that in 2011 the Nashville police submitted the woman's DNA and fingerprints into a national database, to which there were no matches for missing people, and it also confirmed that she didn't have a criminal record. A detective weaver who was involved in the case said, It's kind of amazing there are prints. You've got DNA, you've got a pretty intact body. Visibly, you can see her features pretty well, of course what she was wearing, and no one can identify her. Once again, there is a post-mortem photo available of Jane Doe, as well as these facial reconstructions. I'll include a link to the post-mortem photos if people do want to go see her face. This case is interesting because with her expensive dental work, she doesn't seem to be your typical Jane Doe. She did likely have access to money at some point in her life. I'm not saying she was super, super rich, but to be able to spend $10,000 on dental work does suggest that she had money to spare. It's also interesting to me that they've never been able to trace the dental work. I will assume they sent bulletins out to dentists statewide to see if anybody recognised their own work. I don't know if they would have done that nationally though, but nobody came forward. As a potentially older woman, so aged between 30 and 55, she would have come into contact with a lot of people throughout her life. There's a lot of eras of lives that people can live in those years. There are undoubtedly people out there who would have known Jane Doe, whether closely or just passing acquaintances. The beauty of this being a fairly recent case from just 1998, so 24 years ago, means there are most likely still people out there who would have known her. Identification here is very, very possible, especially considering that it does seem we do have DNA on file. And of course, we're not just looking for an identity here, we're also looking for a killer, and her identity will likely lead to answers as to that as well. Again, I'll leave contact details down below for relevant authorities, and it does seem that Crime Stoppers are offering a $1,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of the suspect in this homicide, and her identity may well be the thing that leads to that. 
as I said at the beginning of this video, if you or anyone close to you lives in the West Alton, Missouri area or Nashville, Tennessee, please do pay extra close attention and share this video, share this story with the people who are close to you. The first two cases I talked about here, we don't have DNA, so we are just relying on people spreading the word, good old fashioned detective work to get the word out there. The last case we do have DNA so I'm sure eventually a match will be struck on a genealogical site but for now again it's just about spreading the word. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.